Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Did you with the many diaries? I know you like diaries. Um, did you prefer to many either for fun or for profit in your writing? My diaries? No. Um, diaries like by written by anybody who was involved in this. Um, Haldeman's diaries are really the most interesting. They um, he kept a diary from the day the administration began, and um, they're kind of weird and ghostly to read. He, he talks about Nixon with a strange kind of detachment, and he always refers to him as P. P went here, you know, for president, and Nixon sort of, he seems like a cyborg almost uh, at moments. <laughs> he's very candid um, and, um, and, and really interesting. I think, um, I'm trying to think if there were other um, diaries besides Haldeman. I think that was really the only one Except Nixon, um, the, even without the tapes, which are in their own way are a weird sort of diary, um, but even without them, Nixon's schedule was recorded in a moment-by-moment -moment way that allows you to reconstruct the, the days of his presidency one by one to an extent that um, you can't quite with uh, the other presidents. So this was, I think, the only novel I ever research where I, I wish there were less material. There was so much of it. They all wrote memoirs, uh, I mean, if only to pay their legal bills. Uh, and there was all of the committee transcript and the tapes and um, so forth. So uh, it was kind of a, a, a morass in a way. But uh, Haldeman's diaries are very much worth reading. Um, yes? How did you arrive at, uh, the book's a treat, by the way. I just Thank you. For a water Thank you very much. How did you arrive at Fred LaRue as a, as a main it's an unusual choice, I think. Fred was sort of, um, in, in historical terms, he was a minor player, and <clears throat> he was the bag man. Uh, who, he arranged the hush money payments. Um, and uh, there were <coughs> two things. Uh, he was this very odd character from Mississippi. He lived in the Watergate, as did Rosemary Woods. She lived in Watergate West. The Watergate was kind of a Republican hive. The Mitchells lived there. It was sort of a fortress. You could do all of your shopping down in the plaza if there were demonstrations outside it, which they frequently were. If they couldn't get a permit for the Pentagon, they sometimes demonstrated in front of the uh, Watergate saying, well, it's full of Republicans anyway. <laughs> uh, do it here. But LaRue lived there. Um, he, uh, he had no title, no salary, was not in the White House directory. Uh, he was sort of a fixer for Mitchell. And he ran interference between Mitchell's Justice Department and Senator Eastland, who ruled the Judiciary Committee on Capitol Hill, um, but he got involved. Um, Mitchell brought him over to the campaign in 72, and it fell to him to organize these payments. And uh, there were two things that um, really made me think of him. I saw a documentary that was made about Watergate about 20 years ago, and he was so soft-spoken and so unlike all those junior executives. He yeah. was older than they. Um, and he, he started to cry on camera. He loved John Mitchell, and um, and loved Martha, uh, and uh, he, uh, he he understood the enormity of it in a strange way. And the other thing that I learned early on when I started looking into him was that when he was um, 29 years old, um, he inherited a million dollars from his father when he accidentally shot him in a hunting accident. To be redundant, when he shot him in a hunting accident, so it was real. That interested me a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, becomes, in, in some ways, that becomes uh, the Rosetta Stone uh, Watergate uh, as the book unfolds. Is the Clary Lander stuff that's, that's fiction? There are three characters who are not real, and the only real clue to this is there's a long dramatis personae at the front of the book. They're the only three whose names are in quotation marks. Okay. Uh, the other, one of the others is Tom Garahan, the woman, uh, the man with whom Pabs is supposed to have um, yeah. So, what did, how did you apprehend Watergate while it was happening? I mean, there you are up in Harvard and not too many Nixon supporters uh, in the dorm or whatever, wherever you were rooming. Yeah. What, did, what did it feel like for, uh, for you at, at that time? Well, I, I, was, I, I, mean, I was in a more liberal phase than I wound up. <laughs> <laughs> um, wound up being in permanently, but uh, and I'm not, I remember thinking it was. I was inspired by the comedy of it all at the 
time. I remember laughing a lot. I was still actually at Brown, I was a senior. And I remember when we used to watch it, somebody had a little television in Miller Hall, and we used to go and watch it, and I think after, you know, nobody got shot in Watergate, and I think after Vietnam, it was, there was this kind of comic expiation um, that it, it, no matter what side you were on, um, you sort of felt. And uh, it was so, I, I mean, I was, um, I hate this cliche, you know, about changing the narrative. All the politicians use that now. Uh, narrative belongs to storytellers, not politicians. But, but the narrative of it was so fascinating, even as it unfolded. And, um, you know, I can remember my father, who, like I said, was a died in the war Nixon man, and was going down with Nixon's ship. And, uh, you know, I remember watching with him, uh, watching the news with him one night when I was home in the summer, and the, the only time he cracked for 30 seconds, he turned to me on the couch and he said, Liddy is a weirdo, isn't he? <laughs> and, and I said something like, yeah. <laughs> and then he was back on message. Um, <laughs> but I think um, at the time I was sort of, um, uh, you know, detached from it in a way, in a way that you could not be detached from something like Vietnam. Uh, I, and I think that um, it just seems, um, th there's a line that I can't even quote it, even though I wrote it, uh, there's a line that Mrs. Nixon and things said, you know, Watergate, it was colossal and it was nothing. You know, it, it was gigantic and it was a molehill. And it was all of those things. It was colossal, but it was also ludicrous. It was a third rate burglary, at least to begin with, you know? So um, I, I think I always sort of saw it in, through some kind of literary lens. Um, yes? Uh, I don't understand something. I'm reading in the, uh, the copyright page. It says, this is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are even the product of the author's imagination and based or used fictitiously. Any resemblance to any to actual persons living in the virtual locale is entirely coincidental. <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite get it. I, I, I don't either. I mean, the lawyers <laughs> get it in, you know, routinely. And, um, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, the book was lawyered, as they say. And I mean, I did have to write long memoranda. Uh, fortunately, just about everybody's dead. Um, but, and I, um, I gave a wide berth to the living. Uh, the, I mean, the two living principles really are uh, Liddy and uh, John Dean. Um, and I didn't want to tell their stories anyway. They, they both told their stories very vividly in their own books. But the language, um, I think the key phrase in, the, in that fairly risible paragraph is used fictitiously. Yeah. They're real people who are used fictitiously, which is, I guess, to say that, you know, um, my Fred LaRue is in quotation marks. He isn't the real Fred LaRue. He's my refraction of him to some extent. Um, but uh, I'd never seen it put quite so uh, foolishly. <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, why did you choose to write about the book Christopher Hitchens? Christopher Hitchens uh, was a good pal of mine. Uh, I, I loved uh, Hitch. He was a wonderful man. Uh, I, I mean, you've all heard and read these um, tributes to him over the uh, last several months, and. Uh, the one thing that I don't think they captured about him was um, his gentleness. Uh, you know, he was a ferocious um, uh, debater. Uh, he's uh, terrifyingly smart, uh, and he was, um, but he was also very kind and very protective, and um, had um, a surprisingly smaller ego than people thought. Um, he actually appears in a book of mine called Fellow Travelers as Kenneth Woodford, uh, this reporter for uh, The Nation. Uh, he read Fellow Travelers, talked about it with me at length, never once recognized that that was him. I don't think he recognized the gentleness in himself. Um, I loved him. I think he was heroic. He lived his life politically always between two fires. He was fearless. Uh, he used to remind me of Mary McCarthy uh, in his fearlessness. and. Um, he, uh, in the last year of his life, uh, was displayed such incredible physical bravery, um, aside from everything else. Um, and um, we were just 
good pals. I, 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 so it was I a tribute to him rather than anything of the nature of the world. Nothing to do with Watergate. That's but what I, one of the many things I loved about um, Hitchens uh, is he was an American by choice. The dedication actually reads to Christopher Hitchens, comma, American. And um, he, uh, you know, he took the oath of citizenship in the Jefferson Memorial. He was very proud to be American. Uh, and he, he took in America warts and all, uh, Watergate and all. You know, all of that stuff um, was, uh, it was all of a piece to him. And um, I have had, um, you know, when you get to the, the age I am now, you know, a hangover is like a medical event. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had some corkers um, uh, the morning after uh, you know, being with him. And, uh, but I, I just, I, I don't, he wrote so much to the moment. You know, people read those cancer pieces that he wrote in Family Be Fair, and they're very eloquent about all that he was going through. But at the same time, all year long, he was writing about Gaddafi, and he was writing about the primary campaign, and he was writing about all of the things that he did. I have never seen anything like this. And um, I just, I hope that people will continue to read him. Um, his publisher is reissuing three of his books uh, next month. Uh, in time for this very big memorial service uh, that Graydon Carter is putting together. And they're issuing his book on the Clintons, which made it a lot of enemies in Washington. Um, and uh, his book on Kissinger and the book on Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. And they thought it would be fun. To, so they've got new introductions for all of them. And so I got to write the Mother Teresa introduction. <laughs> <laughs> which means another three years in purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so those books are, um, you know, are really coming back. But he was fun. I mean, when he died, you could feel the IQ of Washington drop five points the day he died. He uh, it was nobody like him. It was um, social life in Washington was very um, um, structured compared to New York. I mean, everybody still wears a tie if you go to somebody's house for dinner. You know, um, uh, and uh, but Hitchens, uh, play, it was a kind of party apartment too. And, um, you know, you would meet absolutely everybody there. These crazy, crazy dinner parties that were reflective of his own bifurcation. You know, um, you know, Grover Norquist and Salman Rushdie, you know, on <laughs> two sides of you, and um, and then you know, and it, and it went on all night. Um, but he was, um, he was a heroic, wonderful, lovely man. Tom, you uh, you just mentioned uh, a while ago. Um, was her account of Watergate helpful to you? Do you know, I, I wouldn't let myself reread it. Uh, Mary McCarthy was a, a friend and mentor uh, to me. She wrote a book uh, in, she covered the Urban Committee hearings and wrote a book called The Mask of State. Uh, and um, most of the pieces were published in the, the Observer in London and the New York Review. And, um, uh, and it came out in book form uh, in the 70s. <coughs> and it's, it's wonderful, but I, I wouldn't, um, I've absorbed so much of Mary over the years that I, I didn't dare let myself say, I mean, I'm, uh, I've never seen Frost Nixon, because uh, I wouldn't let myself, you know, I didn't, um, uh, I, I didn't want, I don't know, Frank Langella to seep into me uh, along with everything else. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll see it now, but, um, uh, but it'd be, and it, I'd love to, to go back and uh, read Mary's book now, too, uh, you know, without, the osmotic. Thing. She says something similar to what you said earlier at Watergate after the, uh, the tragedy of Vietnam, she said, kind of Seder play or, yeah. or um, uh, Rite of Expiation. Yeah. And I, I think that, that that really was true. Um, as I, I think I saw it ultimately. I mean, I, I think I fundamentally have a comic term, term in mind anyway, and I think I saw it as a, a ultimately. Um, less serious thing um, maybe that she did. But uh, the, uh, the basic thing I think was, was true, that um, the, uh, 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 the, the purgative aspect of it, it, it would not have unfolded the same way if there hadn't been Vietnam. That I feel certain. I mean, for one thing, you know, Nixon would not have gone over the edge he did if he had not felt as embattled as he did uh, against everything from Ellsberg to the demonstrators who were uh, you know, ringing the White House in the spring of '70. So I, I do think that, um, that Vietnam was absolutely conditioning to it. Um, 
When I was a teenager, I used to read the, uh, uh, the novels, and they were all historical novels uh, with a Renaissance setting. And uh, after a while, those novels became books of history mm -hmm. in, in my mind. And uh, later on, I was uh, horrified to find out that I was full of misinformation. Still, mm -hmm. up to this day, uh, what I read in those novels has affected my sense of what went mm -hmm. on uh, at the time. Uh, Michelangelo is a towering figure, and I still resent very much Leonardo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then, many uh, years later, there was a film on uh, Mozart. Mm -hmm. uh, and I met so many people who uh, just will say without thinking that il grand salieri to use Beethoven's words actually poisoned mm -hmm. Mozart. Now that's fiction, but it has colored the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the sense of history of, of a lot of people. What do you feel about the fact that you might be deceiving <laughs> us? <laughs> I mean, I hope I am. <laughs> I wrote in one of my books, I think it's in Henry and Clara, um, you know, that nouns always trump adjectives. And it's important to remember um, that historical fiction is fiction. And I, I have had many people over the years uh, say to me in, a, in the nicest way, I've learned so much history from your books. And I always want to say, be careful, you know, you don't really, uh, a lot of it's been altered. And um, so I, uh, you know, I, I do think that, I mean, historical fiction has its place, it, it, its function, aside from entertainment. I mean, from the time of Sir Walter Scott, it's always had a kind of allegorical function. People try to see their own times uh, in the times that are being written about. But um, I did a piece uh, several months ago for The New Yorker about what's called alternate history fiction, which is kind of the down market uh, part of the historical, uh, I refer to it as my genre fiction is genre fiction. And, um, <laughs> You know, these are the books where the South wins the Civil War and uh, things like that. And I, I've never done that. I mean, you know, Nixon still resigns in this book, whatever. And, and so I've never seen historical fiction as doing things, uh, presenting a world that might have happened instead of the one that came into being. Uh, I tend to present things that might have happened in addition to the things that happened, things that might have happened within the cracks, things we already know. But, uh, but I do think it, uh, it, it should um, be read cautiously. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman, I'm sorry, I missed it. OK, two quick comments and then a uh, question. Red Watergate, I think it is absolutely fantastic. So well, thank you. As for Hitchens, he will be remembered. He's regarded as a patron saint of the secular mm -hmm. movement. So I think he will be read mm -hmm. for generations. <clears throat> and I'm also mentioning Hitchens in a sense because uh, I was wondering, when you were creating your fictional version <coughs> of characters like Holman and uh, Colson, for example, did you think about what they did post Watergate? And I'm speaking especially in terms of Colson, because as you know, he's become a uh, religious fundamentalist zealot and science denialist par excellence, so, which I strongly object to. He um, he's a very minor figure in the book. I, I the only one of these people I ever knew uh, was E. Howard Hunt, uh, and I um, I knew him not especially well, but but I did know him. Um, we uh, he was a brown man, as was Colson, um, and he was a classmate of my favorite professor at Brown, Elmer Blistein, the man who took who taught me Shakespeare and who advised my thesis on Mary. And I met Hunt at Elmer's house one time. I'd gone up to give a talk at a Brown commencement, one of these forums. And Hunt was there at the little party that Elmer gave for me afterwards. And um, we talked, and I, um, you know, I just thought, this is a trip. And uh, he gave me his card and so forth. And then, uh, a year later, I was at GQ, uh, <laughs> reporting to Mr. Beiser uh, there. And uh, the, the big, one of the big books that was about to come out um, 
in 92 was Norman Mailer's spy novel, Harlot's Ghost. And um, we decided we were going to cover it. And I thought, maybe I'll try to get Hunt to review it. Because he'd been a spy, and he'd written spy novels, really, and he needed money. And, uh, and we paid very well. And so I, I sort of had to tell him, but Howard, this can't be a crazy piece. You know, I knew this, I knew this was a really, really a tightrope act. And we just figured we'd see what came in, you know, and paying him. And what came in was really a good piece. I was, it was quite measured. He uh, and gave Mailer his due. He said that um, Mailer was exactly the kind of smart young man he would have recruited to the CIA in the 40s, the way he, he was William Buckley's station chief. Um, and Hunt used to write me letters in the morning. He was one of these guys who warmed up on a manual typewriter, uh, pre-internet. you know, internet. And I had about 40 letters from him, just um, kind of shooting the breeze about one thing or another. And he, uh, I remember one time, uh, I went out and had a meal with him here in New York, and he, um, uh, he st I, and I, I realized I, I would never make a really good reporter. I, I mean, it's much better that I write fiction, because I, Far from wanting to know things, I was always sort of with Hunt thinking, I, I don't want him to tell me something. I don't want, want to, I don't want to know that he was on the grassy knoll or something. You know, it's, it's like, more than I can handle. Um, and I used to imagine going. I would be going back to the office and say, "You got to put somebody else in." This. But he, uh, we did talk about Colson one time, and I asked if he was still in touch with him. He said, "No, no." He sends me his books. He says he always inscribes them, "Yours in Christ, Chuck." He had no time for Richard Nixon. Uh, I mean, he was very unforgiving of Richard Nixon. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you know, I um, I sort of liked him. He was strange, odd company. He was never. I don't think I ever had a relaxed moment in his company. But he was interesting. But you know, you one. I had to remind myself when I was little, this is somebody who blackmailed the President of the United States. Whatever, whatever Nixon did in rising the debate, which was criminal, uh, nonetheless, um, he blackmailed the President. And um, a, it was just strange to be, you know, having a lunch with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elliot Richardson is generally thought of as one of the heroes of Watergate, but he dissented. <coughs> yeah, he's um, he's sort of this pompous wingbag. You know, but, you know, I, I think that's the Irish. I, I really do. I think I think what that is. I, I I thought about this just the other day. I think it was. I think that was those five years in Harvard, 40 years ago. Uh, but, you know, just when it was still this sort of wasp citadel, and I just thought. He was this incredibly, um, the mouth booted voice, you can, you can barely make him out on the tape sometimes. When he talks, he looks in his um, And I think he was fiercely ambitious. And Nixon was one of the people who recognized this. And the, uh, you can find it on YouTube. I mean, the Nixon tapes, they're all over. You don't even have to go through the Nixon library website anymore. But there's a, phone call that Nixon makes to Richardson on the night of April 30th, 1973, the night he fired Haldeman, fired Erlman, and he makes Richardson attorney general. We've got to get Mr. Clean, the Boston Brahmin, in there, you know, to regain credibility. So he calls um, Richardson that night in McLean, and Richardson, at that point, he's secretary of defense for about 12 minutes. He had all of these cabinet jobs. And he's got the joint chiefs of staff uh, at a dinner party. And uh, Nixon, you can sometimes hear the ice cubes clinking in the glass. <laughs> like, and, and, well, Elliot, what would you think of the speech? And it's so obvious that they detest each other. And, uh, and Nixon says, well, you know, it's now going to fall to Richardson to investigate this. And he says, well, you know, uh, Elliot, this could take you all the way. And, uh, and what, what Nixon is thinking about, what he was always thinking about, was the Hiss case. The Hiss case had made him. It had set him on the road to the presidency. And he was thinking, if you handle this right, do a thorough investigation, but not too thorough. Um, <laughs> you know, you'll get the nomination in 76. And, um, and Richardson is, you know, talking and slurring a lot. I mean, Richardson was a tremendous drinker. He would have had tremendous confirmation problems uh, in this day and age, given his driving record and uh, so forth. But he, um, but Nixon pushes him in the conversation and he says, do you know, 
I'm not sure you really need a special prosecutor for this. I think you could do it yourself. <laughs> and of course, that's what they would come to grief over six months later. And uh, Richardson doesn't want to get painted in a coin. He says, but I'm not really sure about that. And Nixon does not. He's at such a low point in his fortunes, he does not want to push this. So he immediately walks that back, as you know they would say today. And he said, oh, you do whatever you want to. I'll back you to the hill. You need a special prosecutor, you appoint one. You can dig up Charles Evans Hughes if you want. <laughs> <laughs> and then just go on and on and on. And they're both at least a little bit bombed. You know? but, um, but Nixon is always a step and a half ahead of Richardson. Richardson's great. But he was tremendously ambitious. And there was, is it his last scene in the book, He's marooned in Hawaii when Nixon resigns. And he's desperate to be named Ford's vice president uh, when Ford takes over. And I, I knew, I just, I knew, my instincts told me that, that he was very preoccupied by that. I would never admit that to anybody. And his papers just opened up within the last two years in the Library of Congress. And I found in the folder from August of 74, all on hotel stationery, and he's long, call sheets, all the telephones he's, calls he's making to push his case to become vice president. His uh, assistant was the very young Richard Darman, and they had lists of who to call, who not to call, whatever. And he's doing this all from Hawaii, and he can't leave because he's got to give this speech to the American Bar Association in a few days. And it's killing him, you know, not to be back. And he sees the prize. It's either going to slip away to Rockefeller uh, or to George Bush Sr. So I, um, it, he, um, you know, I'm not a believer in this business of theater. The characters take on a life of their own. I always, I don't feel that. But he sort of kept inflating with hot air when I <laughs> wrote about him. And he wound up being the sort of foil. Okay. Um, one more question? Um, anyone have an opinion about Richard? Yeah, <laughs> I'm just curious, when you started the process, uh, did you go in with certain preconceptions major preconceptions that you ended up abandoning and what surprised you along the way in terms of what final product was? Um, probably the extent to which it became a book about the women. Uh, three of the seven characters are women and they, um, it, in a lot of ways it became their book, I think. Um, there were, um, uh, I mean, I, a few things that, um, Surprise me. I mean, about Nixon himself. I mean, I have violently mixed feelings about Nixon. And um, one of the things that I was struck by was uh, the degree to which, when Watergate was at its absolute worst, uh, the degree to which he was running the foreign policy of the United States, not just competently, but in a visionary way. I mean, October 73, the month of the Saturday Night Massacre, is also the month of uh, the Arab Israeli War. And Nixon is overriding everybody in the State Department and the Defense Department and saying, get everything into the air. The Arabs are about to push the Israelis into the sea. Golda Meir tells him they're going to put a statue of you up in Israel. I mean, he's basically saving Israel, which was on the ropes militarily for a while. And as soon as he's done it, he starts pressuring them to make a settlement. Now is the time. And Sadat, who's uh, uh, about four years into his presidency in Egypt, is so impressed by this that he throws the Russians out of Egypt. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds of Russian military advisors, and he says, we'll go with the United States. And so Nixon, in June of 74, he has an invitation to go to Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Syria. I mean, no president since would ever get invited to those five countries. Once, and he goes with his flabitic leg, <laughs> and he's, you know, ready to die in the open car as he's cheered in Cairo. And it's very clear to me that one of the things he's thinking of is that I could pull this off. After China, after Russia, after the Paris Peace Accords, if I can get a Middle East agreement, they're never going to throw me out. They can't, you know? And of course he fell short and, uh, you know, time ran out. But I, um, you know, people used to say that Bill Clinton compartmentalized. That was the, the word they always used. And I mean, Nixon, I think, did this in this um, weird, dissociative way. But, but there's part of me that, you know, while I was reading that, I thought, well, if that's compartmentalization, 
you know, viva compartmentalization. Um, uh, maybe you have to be crazy to do that job, I don't know. Uh, but so th those things really um, struck me. I was also struck by how much I remember. I, I just, uh, you know, I mean, I remember already at the, at the beginnings of that, um, you know, going upstairs and forgetting a name, uh, forgetting what I went up the stairs for. And um, so much of this, you know, I, I, it was just a function of my youth, I guess, in the time. Uh, even the minor players, the minor phrases, uh, you know, uh, it, it all came back very quickly. So in a sense, it was an easy book to research because um, it just wasn't starting cold. Uh, 